Welcome back to the MLOps Community Coffee Session. Today, we're joined by Cody Coleman and none other than my favorite co-host, Vishnu Rachakonda. In this episode, we're going to explore how a kid who was born in prison, raised by his grandparents, and went to one of the worst high schools in New Jersey, ended up getting a degree in computer science from MIT and then studying his PhD at Stanford alongside with some of the greats being advised by some of the biggest names in machine learning, including Mate, that guy from Databricks, or Andrew Yang, that guy who basically is the machine learning guy. I don't need to explain it to you all. So today, when you hear different cliches about machine learning, you may hear things like data is the new oil is an older one that we hear a lot, or also the classic 80% or 90% or 86% of machine learning projects never actually make it into production, or a data scientist time is actually just spent cleaning data, all of these cliches we hear, and I guess they have a reason that they were started and then they became cliches. And now it feels like there's a new cliche on the rise, which is that we need to pay more attention to the data than the models. And Cody Coleman is the perfect person to talk to about this because right now he just finished his PhD at Stanford where he's been doing some incredible stuff around data-centric AI. He also has a bit of a track record with benchmarks. He started the MLcoms benchmarking system that some of you may be aware of. And in this session, we talked to him about all of that, including his life story, which we'll start off with. And let's get it started. It's great to have you here. I'm very excited to chat with you about democratizing machine learning as we were just talking about, but also what is almost becoming cliche these days in the idea of data-centric ML. And you have a lot to say on that. And the idea of quality over quantity is huge for you. So we're going to jump into all of that. But let's start with your story. Let's hear how you came to be where you're at. I mean, you've done a lot in your career already, and it feels like you're just starting. Yeah, totally. So that's a super great question. Um, I, I guess I should ask, like, how how long should I should I uh, kind of make my answer here? Um, <laughs> give us, uh, yeah, give us however you feel comfortable, man. Don't worry, we've got all afternoon. Okay. Okay. Um, So I'll kind of center this around kind of computer science and machine learning and and kind of that whole piece, because um, I I think very much kind of a a lot of points in my life kind of shape who I am today and the opportunities I've kind of gone after. So um, and especially thinking about democratizing machine learning. So kind of going back to the beginning, I came from a pretty humble background um, kind of in life where you wouldn't really expect, uh, uh, I guess, kind of uh, which would be surprising given like now finishing up the PhD and stuff like that. Um, so I, I came from a humble background. My father left before I was born. I was actually born while my mom was in prison, put into foster care, and then adopted by my maternal grandparents. Um, and even though my uh, my maternal grandparents had kind of a big heart for kind of taking in me and my siblings, they didn't really have much left to give us. So we kind of grew up poor, like on welfare and food stamps kind of all my life um, in New Jersey, South Jersey. Um, I didn't go to like a, a, a fancy high school. I went to kind of just a normal public high school. We were ranked, I think, like 300 out of 322 schools for the state of New Jersey. Um, so like really there, there, there was just kind of like none of these like opportunities and didn't uh, like my worldview was like so small at the at the beginning of the day. And there was a lot of things that just kind of in that life I uh, were were uh, not great, you know, um, we constantly had like trouble with police. I think there was like uh, my, my mom in particular, she had kind of been released from prison, but she was declared insane. So I think we got like 
65 police reports over the 25 years that we lived there just because of crazy things wow. that you would do. So it's just like constant chaos, you know? And, and for me, um, kind of amongst this chaos, you know, I was like the lowest concern kind of out, out of the family. Like uh, literally my, my mom got cats and dogs um, as pets and like use the money that she would get uh, to take care of me for those cats and dogs. But I was allergic to them. So I was sick the entire time. Um, so kind of with that background out of the way, kind of the, the way that computer science kind of first came into my life is oh, that no, I was like a huge video let's game just do nerd. Post. We can slice and dice um, so on. I was like playing Halo back in the day on Xbox and it was um, great. Uh, also super love, super smash brothers actually like right before this, um, they just revealed the like final character for super smash brothers ultimate. So I was watching that. And, um, I just love that, like, like with a computer, you could create this like entire virtual world, which was kind of an escape, you know, like I could actually kind of go and be transported to this all like this kind of really kind of magical place. Um, and, and ultimately, that's kind of where my love for for computer science kind of initially started was with the fact that like with a, uh, a computer and an Internet connection, you could create something that would impact the lives of like thousands or millions or um, now even billions of people around the world. You know, that was super magical to me. And um, as I looked at kind of like other forms of engineering, you know, like if you look at like mechanical engineering or like chemical engineering or all these things, I was like, man, you need all this expensive equipment, you know, like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of like equipment to do anything. Oh, yeah. Which which was like like unimaginable for me at the time that I could ever get access to that equipment, you know? So there was that, that kind of piece of, of computers being uh, approachable and achievable for, for me uh, that I kind of always gravitated to. Um, and then kind of fast forward, I like worked super hard and then I got into to MIT um, for undergrad. And uh, uh, it was kind of funny. I didn't know like, uh, like I, I didn't know that computer science was a thing that you could major in until filling out like the common app and there's like a drop down. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> I, I like computers. And, um, I also was like a huge nerd. I would watch like the discovery and science channel. So then that was like, uh, I was like, Oh, you can do computers and science. Like what I could major in that. Um, and then I found like the, the best school for computer science was like MIT and went there. Um, and Wait, can I just, and, can I stop you real fast? Because oh, yeah. There's something very interesting about what you said and you just brushed over it, which is that you worked really hard at this school in New Jersey, which was one of the worst. And then you got into MIT. So it must have been one hell of a ride to go from that. Like, did you get outside help or were you just learning through the internet and learning through doing? Yeah. So great, great question. Um, there's kind of a few factors that I think were important here. Um, so one, my oldest brother, he's 18 years older than me. So when I was born, uh, and we were all basically kind of like, uh, uh, kind of scattered around a little bit. My, my maternal grandparents adopted all of us, but my brother, he was like, basically like this family's crazy. And like, he's 18 years old. So as soon as he could, he like left the house and stuff like that. Um, and he went to Rutgers and Camden, New Jersey. He ended up dropping out, but he got a job in IT at University of Pennsylvania um, without a degree. And then he was like working there and then um, kind of like kind of got life a little bit settled. So when I was like in middle school, he came back into my life and he was kind of this this like role model to me that gave me hope. You know, I was like he went through everything that I did um, and more and he was able to get out of the house and he was living like a comfortable life. Um, and he was like really into to IT. So he helped me build my first computer and stuff like that and came back um, and, and really kind of opened up, uh, uh, I guess, kind of this black box that is like computer science. Right. Because like one thing, like like where I grew up, like people like 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 things like Facebook and Google, like it doesn't it doesn't translate that like you can make these things and that there's people behind it or even like video games. You know, it's just like it's just like kind of magic that happens. And um Kind of with him actually seeing like, oh, this is what a computer is, you know, like putting in the motherboard, putting in like snapping in memory and stuff like that, being afraid that I was going to break like the the like RAM for my computer and stuff and like trying to ground and like all that kind of like really just made me realize that like, oh, this is how this stuff is made, you know, it's like actually tangible. It's actually something that I can do. So that was kind of the first like initial inspiration in my head. Um, and then he also kind of pushed me for like colleges and stuff like that. He was. Um, I'll never forget. It was after like my freshman year, 
we're like driving down to visit. Um, he, he came to pick me up. Um, and then he had a house in Virginia, Virginia beach and we were driving down and he like asked me like, where do I want to go to school? And, and I'm like, uh, you know, like, like, I don't know, I'd like to go to, to a good school. And, um, since I was from New Jersey, I said, uh, like Princeton, um, but, but they'll never accept someone like me. And like, like, even if they, even if they did, like, there's no way that I could afford it. And, um, Sean was kind of the one that he, he challenged me. He was like, what are you talking about? You know, like you're doing well in school. Like if you like, uh, apply, like you're doing well in school. So like you have a chance of getting in and if you get in, they'll make sure that money's not an issue, you know, probably from his like experience at university of Pennsylvania, kind of knowing what like financial aid was. And that's when like a switch flipped in my head when I went from thinking like, you know, like why bother to why not? Um, and then from there, there was kind of some critical, critical things. One, I think that like, um, oddly enough, my school was like, so, um, was, was, was like, wow. it was, it was like kind of at the level of like a close to like vocational school almost, or like, because of the fact that they like, weren't really expecting people to do like crazy stuff, you know, they had like some more kind of vocational things. And even like computer science in a sense was like kind of viewed in that way. We were like surrounded by like Lockheed Martin and stuff like that. And like South Jersey. So there were, there was like like, I don't know, maybe some basic uh, kind of computer science. So I remember starting out in like QBasic and taking a computer programming class, even though my school wasn't that great kind of, um, I think freshman or sophomore year. And I also took like a web development class and things like that, um, where I actually started to learn a little bit more about code and stuff. And, and, uh, and then that worked out. And then I had kind of amazing teachers kind of um, uh, like throughout my time kind of at, at this high school that even though we weren't like the best high school, they encouraged me uh, like, uh, and were supportive so that like, that uh, I just kept working hard and then uh, ultimately ended up having that kind of chance, that opportunity. Uh, but it was, it was crazy, you know, like literally didn't know, like I grew up with my grandparents. So they only had like a fourth grade and a second grade education. So like even school was like, like applying to colleges, they didn't know anything at all. So I just had to like kind of figure that out. And <laughs> yeah, it was, it was crazy. Um, I, I had to figure that out. I had to like go to the guidance counselors, uh -huh. but the guidance counselors are like overworked and stuff like that. I remember even like, um, uh, I went to like visit campuses, but I went to like, um, so from New Jersey, I went up yeah, to like New York, that. but like, I couldn't, like my grandmother couldn't drive me to New York. She's like afraid of highways. So I ended up taking like a bus down to like the, like Lindenwald train station in New Jersey, then taking that to like Camden to get onto like the light rail system to Trenton, then taking like a train from Trenton to like, um, New York, like Penn, Penn station, I think. Yeah. Penn um, station. You go to Penn station. That's actually transit. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. And then taking like the subway from there up to like Columbia by myself to just like go for like a campus tour of like Columbia. So it was just kind of like an insane process of just trying to figure this stuff out. But, uh, I just want to say uh, um, the fact that you were a prodigy was evident by how you were able to figure out multiple systems of public transit in the New York <laughs> Jersey area, because that, that trip right there, I could not do at the right page of 25. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah that should be. The, uh, I, I love it. That should be like a part of the entrance exam. Like how many times, how many transfers did you have to do or the maximum number of transfers? And I think this is like back in the like map quest days, you know, so like you didn't even oh, have like Google man. maps on your phone. I like, I think I like printed out stuff. Like, um, I went to like the, the, <laughs> yeah, I had to like go to the local library actually to like print out like map quest things. And then I had like my little backpack and all these papers and then, uh, made it up there. But, um, yeah. So that, that was kind of a long winded answer to, I guess, kind of pieces of it. Um, in a sense, there was a, a lot of like craziness of just like figuring out stuff. Um, but that's kind of like the story of my life, you know, it was just like, I kind of like, I just like dive into the yeah. deep end and then I figure it out. So, yeah, no, I mean, thank you so much for sharing this, this journey, you know, because stories like yours are, are so powerful. They need to be a part of this entire field, understanding the context for what it is we're doing. I think what you said about Facebook, Google, these products, truly they're products, they're creations yeah. of humans, right? And they power large portions of our lives. But if the people who use them don't see them as that or are not part of their creation, then they can't be inclusive. They can't be truly you know, useful towards solving those kinds of you know, societal challenges that we'd like you know, products like that to solve. Um, so thank totally. you so much. I think this is, this is kind of the thing that I would love our listeners to kind of share what they're feeling about this, you know? Um, 
And so having gotten this sense of where your head was at, you got into MIT, I'm curious now how your interest in machine learning and, you know, how some of the things that you've been working on at Stanford kind of came about. Yeah, so great question. So once I got to MIT, I kind of um, would say that it started out with data, you know, so it's kind of come full circle now that like ML and like AI is kind of going towards this data centric, um, data centric approach, because I would say that I kind of like always like even before I knew it, I was kind of involved in data. So I remember I uh, because I had taken that like web development class in, in high school, I kind of knew like web development. That was kind of like uh, I would say like my gateway drug to like computer science because I was like, oh, I can actually see these things. I can create an application. I can like post it online and actually have an impact. Um, and then like you you go from like kind of a static page to like actually having to deal with databases, you know, and I, I did like freelance kind of like web app development and had to like spin up databases and stuff like that and think about kind of like data management. Um, and then kind of, uh, what ended up happening is kind of, I guess at the end of my PhD or sorry, the end of my undergrad, um, I got kind of more interested in ML and stuff like that. ML was kind of on the rise at, at MIT because this was around like 2013. So when you think about the timeline, right, Alex, uh, like ImageNet and AlexNet was like 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Around then, like, I think, yeah, the AlexNet was 2012 or something like that. Um, yeah. 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 So 2013, like people at MIT are starting to like talk about this. We only had like one machine learning course, which was like uh, this graduate level class that was like infamous. Uh, I think it, I think it's six, uh, eight, six, seven is like the course number at MIT. Um, and I was like, oh, like I want to take this class. I was like, I, I feel like my entire like undergrad degree was like preparing for this like ML class at, at MIT because it was just like notorious for being like really really difficult. Um, so I ended up taking that class. And this was also around the time that like kind of MOOCs had happened. So there was Coursera and there was also edX that happened. Um, and uh, I thought that this was like transformational from like an education standpoint, you know, like thinking about um, like, like I always kind of wonder, you know, I, I feel like I was very fortunate and lucky to be able to kind of go this route and get into MIT. But I think there were so many other people kind of like from my high school and from like surrounding area that could also benefit and could take this content, could do amazing things. And it's just a shame that they don't have access to that, that material. So like this whole push towards kind of like massive open online courses was like, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a thing. Um, and what ended up happening was I, I had like a, uh, uh, I wanted to do my master's of engineering at MIT, this co-term program. And originally I was going to do it in security, but then like everything was happening. Like MIT created like the office of digital learning and they announced the director for the office of digital learning. And I just like saw the announcement. I immediately emailed the director, Sanjay Sarma. I was like, Oh my gosh, I think that this could be really transformational in terms of, uh, the, the, the impact that will have on, on, um, on access and kind of democratizing education. Um, and then after like, a th he was like, yeah, let's chat. And we had like a 30 minute conversation. He gave me kind of like, uh, he was like, why don't you do your, your master's, uh, master's of engineering with me? So I did kind of all this educational data mining and ed tech stuff kind of in parallel to, um, um, to taking this machine learning class. And, uh, it was kind of all this like logging data and being able to process that logging data, um, uh, that kind of got me into like thinking kind of more performant about like kind of ML or about data. I remember they had like a grader for edX that took like multiple days for it to actually run for a course, which was like insane. And we wanted to do research where we had like incremental grades so that we could do interventions um, for students um, and these like massive open online courses because there was huge like dropout. Uh, and I just basically like wrote a faster grader. I like vectorized like the, the grading thing because it was like, it's just a matrix of like the weights of the assignments times like the, the grade that the student got on the assignment. And um, it ended up like speeding this up by like, I don't know, orders of magnitude so that we could actually do that intervention and do that research. So then that kind of like, even before I thought about it, like I was like, this is like data system stuff, you know, like kind of doing like vector operations and stuff like that and taking the machine learning course. Um, and then also being able to apply that to, to um, and improve and intervene in education. So I saw the power of, of machine learning there and I saw the power of data. Um, and originally, um, and then that kind of got me the inspiration to do my PhD. Um, 
So I ended up, I had like an amazing advisor um, as well for my, for my MN, Isaac Schwung. And he was like, I remember meeting with him. He's like, you should apply for PhD programs. And I was like, th- like the first time he said, it, I was like, thanks. Like he, he just like, I don't know, like I, I didn't take him seriously. And then like a few months later, I was meeting with him and talking about some ideas. And he's like, no, like you should really apply for PhD programs. And if money's an issue, I'll pay for you to apply to four schools. So then I was like, oh man, he's like putting his money where his mouth is and, and uh, this kind of whole piece of it. So um, I was like, I'll apply for PhD programs uh, and, and kind of uh, ended up doing that. Luckily, I, I got into to MIT, to Berkeley, to Stanford. And then, uh, and, and then I also applied to UT Austin and got in there. Um, I ended up going with Stanford, but deferring for family reasons. And I ended up working in, in uh, Chicago at a, a, a trading company and actually seeing kind of actually building out, like I built out this like um, kind of massive ETL pipeline and data integrity system. Like it was kind of crazy. Like I, I built out this integrity check system for data that like is basically kind of like what great expectations is now. Like now yeah. I just, yeah. <laughs> I just didn't realize that this was a problem that any other company had, you know, I just like did it in finance where it was like, they had this huge thing. And then, then um, came back to, to Stanford and then just like seeing the power of ML kind of both in kind of ed tag and then finance and all these things, but seeing like how many resources it requires in order to use ML in practice um, really was like, this is going back to like other forms of engineering. You know, you need like hundreds of thousands of dollars of like equipment in order to like, to like do anything with machine learning, even though it's such a powerful tool. So how can we bring that down? And that kind of led to this like whole kind of passion around democratizing ML. Right. Yeah. So I really actually want to get into this idea of, of, of data centric machine learning, data quality, and just, just how, um, you know, increasingly where the past, let's say 2015 to 2020, the emphasis was on model development and model training and new algorithmic approaches. The yeah. approach more recently has been figuring out how to interrogate data and, and, and more critically analyze it as an input into a model and really trying to realize improvements in performance using that. Um, and so what I'd like to kind of get your thoughts on are how do some of the projects you're working on in your PhD, like Dawn Bench and ML Perf, fit into the trend of data-centric AI that we're seeing nowadays? Yeah, so so that's a great question. Um, when, I, when I think about kind of when I started the PhD, it was like very much focused on model architectures. I started my PhD at the beginning of, um, I guess the fall of 2016. So this is after kind of like ResNet had come out, which I would say is like kind of another um, big moment in kind of model architectures that spawned like a bunch of different things where people were doing like wide ResNets, ResNext, all these like things. Um, And there was tremendous effort around that piece of it, the model architecture piece. But um, kind of just thinking about it, I was like, people are going to figure that out. You know, the field is moving in that direction. They're going to optimize model architecture performance for this data set of ImageNet. What are the other kind of like barriers to actually doing this in, in, in production, you know, and creating practical ML systems? And um, the first piece of it, which I, I think is still kind of ongoing, is just like the system cost aspect of it, you know, to at the beginning of my PhD to train like a ResNet 50 model, just a single run of it costed um, like a thousand dollars in cloud credits, which I was like, man, that's a huge barrier for like people to actually be able to enter into this thing. And it would take something like, I don't know, like over 24 hours to be able to actually train this model on kind of like a um, just kind of a, a, a standard instance that you could get from AWS at the time. So we originally created Dawn Bench to kind of push the field forward, both in in times in reducing training time and training cost, and the same thing for inference. And then this kind of grew into to ML Perf, this like notion of end to end performance. Um, where now that's like supported by basically all of the software and hardware manufacturers. So you have like Intel, Nvidia, AMD, Google, all of them kind of like backing this like benchmark and really kind of helping. Um, to kind of push the field forward because, you know, like for, for better or worse, like benchmarks shape, shape the field as, um, as Dave Patterson said. Um, and I think that was really true. And so that was kind of the first part of my PhD. And that kind of became this kind of Don bench ML perf and then ML commons kind of piece of it. And 
And parallel to seeing that train kind of leave the station where like people are caring about performance, reducing cost and, 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 and time, um, I started to think about what are the other kind of big pieces that kind of prevent people from doing um, like AI in practice. And the other kind of elephant in the room that people were just kind of ignoring, you know, was, was data. Like models were basically kind of like the hero of like many of like deep learning successes Whereas like data was always kind of treated as like a necessary evil, you know, it's like, oh, you have this data set, it's noisy, there's these problems, and it's just like a pain to deal with data. Um, but no one really kind of like thought about data as kind of or elevated data to where I think it should be like it should be kind of uh, at the same pedestal, same height as like models, if not higher, actually, um, especially kind of seeing these like kind of trends going forward. So the second kind of bet that I made during my PhD, in addition to the systems, system performance stuff, was actually asking the question, like, can we be more efficient with how we use data? Rather than just purely thinking about quantity of data, can we focus on the quality of data? Can we select kind of a, a smaller number of data points and be intelligent about how we select that and still achieve the same performance? Because this would be kind of a way for us to both um, one, again, kind of reduce like computational resources that we need, but also labeling resources and all of these other costs that come up with, with, with dealing with um, kind of machine learning systems in practice. So, so seeing that second barrier, I was, I was kind of, I felt like, um, uh, a, like a, a bit of a lone wolf at the, at the beginning because I was like, man, you know, there's this research on like active learning and course set selection where I didn't really hear kind of people um, in the ML space talking about this. You know, everyone's just talking about like, what's the next model? What's the next like activation function? <laughs> yeah, like nobody cared. We went through this like cycle in language where it was like RNNs were like really big and then LSTNs. And then, then we had like uh, convolutional ne uh, like neural nets for like language translation. And then we, that was like a, a brief moment in time. And then transformers took everything over. Uh, so yeah, I, I started to think kind of about this like data selection piece and how do we kind of intelligently select data to train on um, and, and label. Uh, and that was kind of a, the work that I did um, with this paper selection via proxy, um, uh, efficient uh, data selection for um, deep learning, which was at iClear, I think in 2020. And then the kind of Kind of next step of that was this um, kind of paper that I wrote, um, Similarity Search for Efficient Active Learning and Search of Rare Concepts, where I did this while interning at Facebook and just seeing kind of the amount of data that they had there and, and really trying to kind of make the systems more efficient. And then now it's kind of been a perfect timing as, as far as like other people are kind of realizing this with this whole data-centric AI movement. Um, and we're kind of actually seeing the, the field kind of move towards that and to be more thoughtful around data. So um, I've been super excited kind of about this entire movement and, and, and kind of very honored that I get to play kind of a part in this, um, both in co-organizing kind of the data centric AI workshop at NeurIPS, um, as well as like just working with like giants like, like Andrew Ang um, and Chris, uh, Chris Ray. Chris Ray has an awesome like GitHub repo on data centric AI that I contributed to. Um, and it's just kind of amazing to see it, to see that community kind of spawn there. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that summary of your sort of, uh, academic work. I think it's some of the papers that you mentioned, we're definitely going to link to, uh, efficient data selection, um, similarity search for that, the, the paper you did at Facebook. It's sounds like really interesting papers. How you feel research and industry can better like live together, uh, and be like good friends as opposed Exist. to being like yeah as it's yeah. like oh the researchers don't do anything that actually is useful for the industry and the industry doesn't share any data that is useful for the researchers so um, and i i've kind of thought about this since i started my phd actually um so i i think that it's getting better as far as kind of academia and industry kind of working together um throughout my phd so I, I part of the reason i actually went to to stanford for for my phd in computer science was because of the fact that it's like here in the heart of silicon valley right down the road from kind of all of these like large companies that are really kind of have all of the data and uh kind of a lot of like really interesting problems and especially if you want to have your research have a practical impact 
where I'm very much of that kind of mind when I think of science. Like, how can we kind of do research and work such that it actually provides utility to society versus kind of, I guess, like the pure research standpoint where it's like just the pursuit of knowledge. Um, so I, I think that like kind of being in the Bay Area was like super nice for that. Um, and then coming into Stanford, um, at the beginning of my PhD, I started out um, right when the Dawn Project was being created at Stanford. Um, so the Dawn Project um, was kind of a collaboration between a number of different um, kind of PIs, faculty members. Um, so Matei, um, Matei Zaharia, Peter Bayliss, um, Chris Ray, and Kunle. So these guys all kind of have like expertise and like different levels of the stack. So Kunle created kind of like the parallel processor. Um, Chris Ray uh, is super well known for snorkel and deep dive and kind of many initiatives there. Uh, Matei is known for creating Apache Spark and Mesos, uh, as well as being the CTO of Databricks. And uh, uh, Peter did like a ton of stuff on transactions and now is starting CSU Data. So um, they kind of explicitly came in kind of with the systems mindset where I think systems research is a little bit more kind of focused on kind of practical use cases. And they wanted to kind of bring that to ML and democratizing machine learning. So that was kind of the whole point of, of the Dawn project. And um, I think it worked out really well. One, there was kind of a, uh, they received funding from kind of industrial partners and really kind of trying to create a partnership there as far as having retreats and actually collaborating with kind of many of the partner companies. So for example, I, I mean, I, I collaborated very closely with, uh, with like Google and, and Facebook um, kind of throughout mm. my PhD, which were, were kind of supporting the Dawn project. Um, and I think that worked really well to kind of have just like the community meet one another and kind of those intersections. Um, and then now, now I'm also kind of, um, so I did this kind of very like uh, industry, uh, th this benchmarking effort around deep learning performance called Dawn Bench. That was probably the first project that I worked on at, um, at Stanford. And this was really meant to be kind of an open community. So we actually had kind of people uh, from around the world, all different organizations. So of course, like Google, Facebook, Fast, Fast, uh, Fast.ai, Intel, as well as like um, Baidu and Alibaba from, from China representing and submitting kind of their kind of best systems and stuff like that to improve the efficiency of training um, and inference. And out of that grew kind of like ML Perf as a larger industry collaboration. And now that's actually kind of blossomed into ML Commons, where it's really kind of this like um, both industry standard benchmarking, but kind of actually this larger consortium of different academic and industry organizations, um, kind of centered around creating common goods for ML that are actually like useful, you know, taking research and actually making it practical and having that cross pollination. So yes. I think a lot of these, these initiatives really help with that. Awesome. I'm curious now, I'm a practitioner in machine learning engineering. Uh, every day, you know, I have some data set that, you know, maybe I get in a batch format or a streaming sort of uh, uh, environment. Uh, I have to think through, you know, the quality uh, of that data. I have to think through, oh man, you know, my ETL broke today, what's going on? You know, this broke today, you know, training job failed. Oh man, what's going on with that system? You know, there's so many different components, you know, that make up a, a successful model training and productionization process. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what is your advice to the practitioner today that is interested in trying to advance where their company is with respect to thinking about data quality, uh, but maybe a little bit confused as to where to start? Is it academic papers? Is it tools that they should be using like great expectations? Or is it just trying to, you know, maybe just get into their data themselves and, and look at more sort of sort of summary approaches. I'm just kind of curious what your advice would be. Yeah, so I, I think that's a great question. Um, when, when I think about kind of practitioners that are building out these kind of ML systems in practice, you know, data is like such a core component of this that um, I, I think making that front and center and thinking about kind of how do I... Uh, how, how do I be very thoughtful about the data at every step of the way? So, I mean, this kind of starts at the very beginning when we think about kind of like more like traditional kind of like data engineering pieces, you know, like how am I kind of storing and kind of like cataloging the data at kind of its lowest level, whether it be, um, and what type of data do I have, you know, because the solutions are slightly different if you're thinking about kind of traditionally structured and semi-structured data. 
Um, I would say kind of the big data movement that we had so far has focused kind of very heavily on that. Um, whereas then there's kind of a, a, a the the kind of holy grail for like data systems for a long time has been kind of more unstructured or has been like kind of bringing in and processing unstructured data, like text, images, video, speech, um, these sorts of data formats, I'd say are a little bit kind of more nascent as far as like how people think about it and how they kind of manage it. Um, but I think that like kind of looking at the structured and semi-structured um, data world, you can actually kind of get like, what, what do these like pipelines look like from like a big data kind of data, uh, data pipeline standpoint and bring a lot of that stuff over. So, so when I think about kind of like from my experience, when I was working at, at um, uh, in Chicago at, at, at this trading firm jump, um, that was, that was like my life. It was like mission critical to have quality data, you know, because you're like actually deploying an algorithm out there that is going to be like using that data to make decisions, important decisions about positions and things like that. Um, uh, so the way that I thought about it was one initially like cataloging data, how do I do that? How do I make sure that I have kind of ground truth so that I can then go and iterate on top of that? Then thinking about kind of like the processing, the kind of ETL pipelines and stuff um, that I do kind of for that kind of initial transform kind of like process and that piece, but ensuring data quality kind of at every step of the way, you know, really you should be inspecting kind of the data kind of at each point to make sure that it's like, okay, what's going on? What's the quality? Where are the issues and stuff like that? Because the more you can do that up front, I think the more time it saves you kind of down the road as far as like thinking about this stuff. Because once you get into these crazy downstream systems, like bad data at the very beginning just has this kind of like amplifying effect and can just pollute everything. So I think I think the systems like like great expectations and like stuff kind of along that realm is probably a really good tool to kind of keep in mind and to think about kind of as that continues to develop. Um, and then once you actually have this kind of like raw data, you know, like now usually it's kind of, when we think about most of the data kind of in practice, um, I would say it's, it's, it's unlabeled data. So then it's actually kind of, once you have like the quality baseline, it's actually, how do you create kind of a data set for your specific problem? You know, and this is where I've kind of focused a lot of my work on um, around data selection, because I think that like data selection, I think other people have called it data curation and stuff like that. I feel like this is kind of, um, still a little bit of a black art when we think about kind of creating data sets, you know, from like an academic perspective and like for machine learning, like it's just like the data set is given to you, you know, it's just like, all right, like we have ImageNet as like a, a golden created data set and we don't have to worry about it at all. And I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff to kind of do there to be kind of thoughtful about um, what data you label and how you use those labels. Um, and a lot of like kind of, uh, different approaches. I mean, you're seeing tons of companies in the space. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's that, that right there, you took this conversation where I wanted to go. You read my mind somehow in, and I'm really curious to dive into your perspective mm -hmm. as a sort of mathematician, as a, as a academic, as somebody that's thinking about the sort of the principle of machine learning as you're going about building systems and, you know, thinking about uh, the future of the field, because when we're taught machine learning, we're taught very much, you have a static train set, it's a yeah. pandas data frame, you have a static test set, it's also a pandas data frame, model.fit, and that's it, right? Yeah. But, but in this sort of data-centric regime, your train set is constantly changing, your test set is constantly changing. For example, the company context that I work in, uh, we work uh, in sort of the insurance reimbursements realm. In any given moment, you know, the rules might change, right? Um, for example, uh, if the Center for, you know, for Medicare comes out and says, hey, we're going to change this billing code, uh, you know, because of COVID to this, you know, to, to this different sort of scheme uh, that has mm -hmm. a huge impact on the data on, on how, um, you know, how to actually set up the problem, right? Your training set has to change. You have to retrain your model, uh, you know, how you have your test set set up. You have to sort of um, reconfigure that. There are, there are these sort of cascading effects when data changes, which is which we all know is like kind of like, you know, sky is blue, grass is green, data, data changes, yeah. um, that seem to kind of violate the principles of machine learning as we are taught them, you know, in an totally. academic setting. And I'm curious what your thoughts are as you've been thinking about this, you know, um, 
in your academic work? How can we think about doing principled machine learning work when the data changes, is dynamic, and can sometimes appear to violate some of the principles that we're taught? Totally. So, so kind of, uh, uh, I think there's good news and bad news. I'll start with the bad news. Uh, I think from like a practitioner standpoint, there's a lot of missing pieces right here where there's not super great tooling kind of for this from an end-to-end -end standpoint. But uh, I think the good news is that we can see kind of evidence of that. As I mentioned, like when we think about data quality kind of initially and like the, the piece that you're talking about in this insurance application, you can imagine picking up things there. Then you can think about kind of the feature engineering standpoint. We have feature stores and stuff like that, which kind of uh, many great people to talk about that. But then like once we come to the actual like labeling piece, you know, actually kind of figuring out what data points uh, we should use to label. I think that this is still a little bit of kind of an, an open space. Um, and, and I think that kind of partially it's been like very ad hoc as a process of people saying, which data points do I actually use to train on? Um, either people go with the approach of like, let's use all of the data, right? Which is very, very noisy generally. Um, and this is, this is very expensive, you know, like, uh, I think one of the things that really resonated to me when Andrew Ang gave his talk on data centric AI was he made this very clear point of like, you need like way more data if you're using kind of like noisy, uh, noisy labels. Like if you don't think about the label quality and you're not really like focusing on that piece, it's going to be like like a multiplicative factor, kind of more data, which is just going to make everything more expensive and more painful for you as like a data scientist, data engineer, ML ops person to deal with and manage. So I think that there's something about kind of being, um, rather than just going with the like qu quantity approach to actually be more thoughtful. And I think that kind of thinking about like active learning, course set selection, these type of methods, uh, which I, I would say are still very academic right now, um, but kind of keeping an eye on that, I think that can help kind of go from what has been kind of like, um, I say creating data sets is just like a, a, a either you don't think about it or you do some like voodoo magic where you're like, I need this like specific slice of data and you try to piece it together. I think if you watch kind of active learning course at selection, I think that there's a lot of stuff where you can actually automate this piece and actually provide kind of like, hey, this is the most important data for you to, to label, which will bring down kind of the amount of like data points that you have to work with by orders of magnitude. So like you can imagine like actually being able to like kind of create a data set that rather than it being millions of images or anything like that, you can actually bring it down to something that's like a thousand images or like a thousand examples or below. And when you think about kind of like just the world of difference, you know, managing a data set that's like a million things versus a thousand things, it's kind of, it, 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 a lot of things break as far as how we think about kind of machine learning systems right now. With like a, a thousand data points, you can actually go as like a, an individual person or like a small team and actually kind of be able to inspect and ensure that that data is really high quality, you know? You can even potentially do the labeling yourself rather than outsourcing it. And then it just makes it so much easier to kind of reason about the data that's going into your system and to be able to kind of edit the data, to be able to kind of, um, kind of, uh, manipulate that uh, rather than kind of like trying to like kind of piecemeal stuff together and kind of do a lot of band-aids to this problem. So I think getting into that mindset and getting into kind of being very, very thoughtful about what data you're using is probably the first step from a practitioner standpoint to, to kind of go with this data-centric AI kind of mindset and to actually regain control over data and the ML systems that we're deploying in practice. And then there's a lot of stuff that you can do kind of from monitoring and kind of dealing with time dependencies as well. Super, super helpful answer. And the sort of question that came immediately to mind as soon as you mentioned some of these approaches, active learning, course at selection, um, is what amongst those stand out to you as most promising? Uh, I think just as a kind of preface to the question, as a practitioner, what I appreciate about the academia to industry pipeline is that industry grapples with some emergent problem and academia abstracts it into a framework that I can apply, right? Then, then I can kind of say, when I look at a new problem context, I can go back and say like, oh, okay, this, that's what this is, right? This yeah. is a situation to apply supervised learning. This is a situation to apply unsupervised. This is a situation to apply active learning. And totally. so what I would love to kind of get to is a sense is, is to a point in data centric AI where we have a set of techniques, 
right? That mm-hmm. we can kind of say like, okay, the data quality is a problem. These are the techniques we can deploy. What techniques stand out to you as being most promising? And how would you summarize the state of the art there? Yeah. So, so I'd say kind of like when we, when we think about kind of active learning, I think it's kind of great to think about concrete example. So, so one of the, one of the problems that I had, you know, like when I, when I was like working at uh, kind of Facebook, I remember creating a simple classifier for bowling. Like that was my goal, you know, could be bowling, could be like many other things that you're thinking about in practice. And um, the, the one thing that was kind of eye opening to me, I was running kind of a very simple active learning algorithm, uh, uncertainty sampling um, based off of just like uh, entropy and super simple kind of like, this has been around for like, I I think the first paper was in the nineties actually in like uncertainty sampling and and entropy. Um, And it's, it's super simple to implement. And the thing that I found that was kind of really amazing when I had this algorithm basically select data points for me, rather than like, uh, me trying to create that data set is that there were so many things that using the model's uncertainty, using actually the machine learning model to, to say like, hey, what is it confused about versus what I would think the model would be confused about? There's a mismatch there. So for example, one, one of the things that was like, hey, this is very confusing for this classifier bowling is it showed me pictures of exercise studios. And like a priori, like me as like a human being, I, I don't think of exercise studios when I think of bowling, you know? Like, I'm like, that seems like a very random thing. But when you actually looked at the image that it selected, it was like, oh, the exercise studio has wood floors. I was going to say it's I, something with the wood floors or the wood, isn't it? I knew it was that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and then like you have these like colorful like exercise balls, you know, which it's like, oh, okay. It's like... um kind of like the bowling balls you would have in a bowling alley. And I was like, oh, I can see why the model would be confused. Like this bowling classifier would be confused by this like a picture of um, an exercise studio, you know? But a priori, if I thought about bowling, I wouldn't have like imagined that. So if you think about kind of where we're currently at, right? Like this is like undefined behavior for a machine learning model, right? Like, like if I didn't specifically label that thing, who knows where it would be on the decision boundary? It might now think that exercise studios and these uh, photos are actually bowling and I, like kind of drive up my like um, like false positive rate. Um, but by letting the, the the ML model tell me what it was uncertain about kind of by using very simple active learning, now I take the guesswork out of that and I can just like listen to what the model is saying rather than kind of taking my worldview as a human being and kind of defining this stuff. And I I think it's very similar to like what we saw with kind of like feature engineering. You know, it used to be we had these like hand tuned features where we'd be like, this is the way that we should look at an image. And then deep learning came through and it's just like, no, let let like the algorithm figure out what the feature should be. I think kind of there's the same parallel here where like previously we had human beings be like, this data point is confusing. And but that didn't match up with like what the machine learning, the, the algorithm thought. And active learning is saying like, hey, let's let the machine, let's let the machine learning model actually tell us what data points we should be labeling and creating that data set. Um, and, and there's other kind of cool problems that will come up here that I, I noticed um, when I was doing this. So I, I, I was there kind of during the pandemic. And um, if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, people went like crazy and they were cleaning out grocery store shelves, you know? Of toilet paper. And, yes, I remember yeah. that. <laughs> All it the toilet absurd. paper aisles. <laughs> Absurd. Uh, I know it's kind of crazy looking back on it. We're like, oh man, you know, we got to get through this. It's going to be like two weeks. We got to have our rations. The world's going to like, it was insane. I definitely thought it was two weeks. I was like, by the end of March, I'll be back in New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we can stockpile all we need from like Trader Joe's. It became like a weird place going to Trader Joe's and just seeing like all just the madhouse of that. But, um, um, an odd thing, if you actually think about like an odd thing that kind of came out of that for this like bowling classifier was that people would take photos of the empty grocery store shelves because like people like, like everyone was like, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. You know, even in the time people were like, this is crazy. Like the shelves are empty. There's all these news articles and they would post that online. And what I ended up kind of like noticing is that the, this bowling classifier was actually then confused about like in doing this active learning loop, it was confused about these photos of these empty grocery shelves, you know? Wow. 
Yeah, because you think about it, it's like the empty shells and there's little dividers between it. So especially if it's like a wood colored shelf or something like that with like the metal dividers, it kind of looks like a bowling alley, you know, like visually, like it took me even a second to look at like this, like zoomed in photo. Like, is this actually bowling or not bowling? And and that's something that as a human being, again, like in that chaos, if I have some classifier that's out there in production and I'm relying on like a human expert to be like, oh, I should update the data set for this example, you know, like that, that just is not realistic. Like I would not have thought to do that until there was some problem in production. And this is kind of a simple example with bowling, but you can imagine kind of like many more kind of disastrous things, right? Like we see this with like computer vision models, um, like Google had this problem where they're like, they're, Google's like vision API would, would um, if you showed it the picture, uh, there, there's, I don't want to pick on Google, but the Vision API had many problems. One, if you showed it the picture of like a black person, it would think that it was like the class gorilla. And that's like something that you don't want to find out in production. You know, when people are using this thing that there's this like undefined behavior. And a, a thing that happened later was like, if you if you showed the Google Vision API a hand holding a, um, holding a, a contactless thermometer, you know, like, because at the beginning of the pandemic, like, we're doing all this contactless um, temperature readings. If the hand was was uh, a light skin tone, it would predict the class um, monocular or something like that. That was some class that was already in, uh, that they had trained on and stuff like that. But if the hand was a dark skin a skin tone, it would predict the class gun, you know? And, and, and this is kind of where these problems come in, where like, if you rely on a human being to be like, hey, something's changed in the world, I now need to all of a sudden change my classifier for like example, um, like a, a real example rather than the bowling thing is like, yeah, someone had this like class, this like classifier from monocular. And then now people are like taking all these pictures, uh, pictures with contactless thermometers. There's probably no one at Google that thought like, oh, we have contactless thermometers that are being like all used all over the place. We should update our monocular kind of like classifier for that. And the same way that no one would think that like, oh, uh, people are posting photos of like empty grocery shelves. We should update our bowling classifier. So rather than leaving that to guesswork, I think that there's a lot that you can do with kind of active learning and like using a model's uncertainty to tell you and alert you on when do you need to update this classifier? When and, and 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 specifically, when do you need to update the data set that was used for this classifier? Like when is there this kind of new example or new set of examples that kind of define this like un, undefined behavior in this like space of this classifier? So I, I, I think from a practitioner standpoint, that's like where we should go, where it's like rather than waiting for a human being to notice this thing and it be like the top thing on, on Twitter, um, to actually be proactive and have these tools using active learning and uncertainty sampling to detect that. That's really helpful, actually. I think as a practitioner myself, I had heard about active learning. I had followed it and, and had, had toyed with the idea of implementing it. But it's not something that it's not a scikit-learn API. Let's put it that way. Okay. And, you know, when you're in a yeah. company setting, uh, you have to justify every every movement you make, right? Because yeah. time is money. And and hearing, you know, your explanation now, it makes a lot more sense when you think about the infinite fallibility of AI systems, yeah. right? Particularly as they grow increasingly parameterized, right? I mean, when you think about some of these models that are what a hundred trillion parameters or something like that. I think something came out of Google or Baidu recently that was that size. Uh, there are so many permutations that um, that can occur in terms of mistakes that can be made, errors in the training data, or or different challenges that can occur um, that can be realized in production, as as you put it. And so, I think one question I have is you have been involved with some of the leading benchmarks in machine learning. Do you think we can develop a benchmark for this? Are benchmarks a potential solution that we can apply? Wow, that's a, that's such a great question. Um, I, I can't give the full details about that, but that is something that I'm actively thinking about and working on. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. Stay tuned oh, um, nice. for- What can you give us? What kind of details can you tell us about? Well, well, I, I can definitely say that like benchmarking data is um, definitely top of mind for a number of folks. Um, especially a part of this movement towards data-centric AI. So 
I mean, we saw kind of the first example of that with um, kind of, uh, I believe, uh, Andrew Wang and Deep Learning AI creating kind of the data-centric AI benchmark. Um, and you can kind of think of this as being like analogous to, to what I originally created with Donbench, um, which was like Donbench was like a proof of concept effectively, like you should care about this, the community cares about it and stuff like that. And the same way that the data centric AI competition that, uh, that Andrew Ang created was, I think, that kind of first like initial kind of like putting the flag in the ground that like, hey, we should care about um, uh, benchmarking data as a part of AI. Um, and kind of seeing that, uh, uh, like in, in parallel, like a lot of us are thinking like a very similar thing, you know, like how we benchmarked ML systems is kind of an important part and that we should be thinking about how do we benchmark data as well? And um, how do we create this as like an industry standard thing? Because um, the, the, the data centric AI competition, you know, was a great kind of initial in uh, initiative, but there's so many problems related to data um, that it's that like you really need kind of a comprehensive suite of benchmarks for thinking about data within this kind of data centric AI movement. So um, kind of that problem, what is that comprehensive suite is definitely something that's like top of mind that we're, we're thinking about um, for benchmarking and how can we kind of like um, roll in like the initiatives like the data centric AI um, kind of benchmark that that Andrew Ang did into this and like create this into like a, a larger effort that really kind of covers all of these different points that we, we talked about when, when we think about data and like actually benchmarking data quality and creating quality data sets rather than just purely quantity. Right. That I'm excited to hear more about it. I think competitions like that and benchmarks like yours have been a huge part of educating practitioners like me on the importance of some of these topics. It's, you know, it's a push pull. It's, it's, it's sort of a, yeah. a change of ideas constantly between industry totally. and academia, right? And one of the things I wanted to point out kind of is, you know, the companies that I've talked to that have started, that really started their machine learning efforts in the heyday of deep learning ResNet time between 2015 to 2017, right? When they started around that time, but there weren't necessarily the kind of tools that we're seeing now um, yeah. you know, around workflow orchestration, uh, around data quality, even around just, you know, model training, I have found that they have had, they have had an incredibly thoughtful perspective on, on data quality. And they generally do it through a lot of, um, they create like human extensive human in the loop systems. You know, yep. I can't say some of the names of these companies because, you know, this is all privileged information, I guess. Right. But yeah. I think it's, I think it's really interesting to think about at least in the biomedical context that I'm familiar with um, where there are, you know, extensive human in the loop systems that serve as guardrails. Oh, totally. Uh, for for machine learning. And you know, I think I'm kind of curious, do you do you take the perspective that those kinds of guardrails could should continue to involve humans in the loop? Or do you believe automation um and sort of automated testing suites almost like we see with code, right? I mean, we went in in, in the in the in code, we went from QA testers to having everything, you know, baked in through CI C D, right? Should we see something similar in the data world? Um is that is that kind of the opinion that you might have? So, I uh, I think that both are important uh, in a sense, right? Like, so you you definitely want to automate as much as you can, especially kind of like the initial, just like bare bones data quality stuff. But I think fundamentally, like you want to have humans in the loop, right? Because we're thinking about things, especially when we think about kind of unstructured data. Like, this is data that's meaningful to human beings, right? We can like quickly look at an image and be like, what is the kind of the context of this in image and review it. Um, but like just relying on kind of an automated process is a little bit kind of harder there. Now, um, and but the, but the thing is like, what does human in the loop look like? You know, and I think that there's a lot of different ways that we can do it. Even as I, I was talking about with active learning, you know, I was saying like automating the process of which data points do we select like this case of like um, um, like grocery store shelves? Um, but still, ultimately, there's a human in the loop there that has to provide the label for this thing. And I think that actually that's that's better in a sense to have that human in the loop that's labeling these kind of very like carefully selected and curated examples to really define what do we mean by something like bowling, you know? Um, because there's a lot of 
just ambiguity that kind of depends on like your specific business use case and like your domain specific knowledge that like is kind of hard to encode in any other way, right? Like you need to actually go and be like, hey, this should be bowling or this shouldn't be bowling. Um, and I, I think that piece of it uh, will always like, that's like one way to have humans in the loop. And I think that that's super valuable um, because even for simple concepts, like we can have different meanings. There's many different meanings for like a single word or a single kind of prediction that we're doing. Like um, one example that I kind of always use is uh, what comes to mind when you think of the word torch? Um, something like fire. Fire, yeah. Just, you know, someone holding uh, maybe an Olympic torch. Yeah, Olympic torch comes to mind. Me going through uh, caves with a torch and <laughs> yeah. like the somebody you know the movies where they got that and you're being chased by people with torches yeah dude yeah so i i love it i've asked so many people this question and i get so many different answers so like fire and the flame torch is like definitely up there um i've talked to people from the uk and they think of a flashlight when you say torch mm -hmm. um when, when I talk to like, like uh, ML researchers, like they're doing like modeling and stuff like that, they're like pie torch, pie torch. you know? Right. Pie torch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I can't and, lie, and, it did and, come to mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I think this kind of shows the fact that like, depending on your use case, you might have like many different meanings as far as like what this thing is when you're trying to do this machine learning prediction task. And fundamentally, you need to have a human being to kind of help define that and shape that. Um, and I think with this movement for data centric AI, it becomes much more achievable for like a human being to actually understand kind of what is the data set that's defining some concept or something that we're thinking about when you move from millions of examples down to a few hundred um, uh, examples. Uh, and then there's also other things like snorkel um, and their weak supervision where they like allow human beings to uh, write labeling rules. I think that's another way that we can have humans in the loop as far as saying like, hey, what are like kind of the rules? How does kind of taking that kind of human knowledge and defining it in a code and figuring out when should I apply this labeling rule and kind of mixing that stuff together, I think also makes a lot of sense, especially in the world of, of like text and kind of NLP problems where it's almost discrete. You know, you have, you kind of tokenize stuff, you have a vocabulary and you can kind of write rules around these like discrete things um, to be able to define things that you care about. So I think that's like another way to have human in the loop where you can actually iterate very quickly, especially for NLP data. Um, and, and, and we could see this potentially for other forms of data though, like uh, it, it's a little bit less clear to me kind of initially. I mean, I worked with all the snorkel folks when I was at, at Sanford and the Dawn Project. I'm sure they're like dealing with kind of a lot of these problems in practice, but uh, uh, so I, I, basically to summarize, like I think that there, we should try to automate stuff and kind of prioritize human attention and time. But humans fundamentally, I think, need to be in the loop to kind of um, prevent some of these like kind of bad outcomes and, and also just provide kind of that that real world knowledge of what, what actually matters. Yeah, and this exact thing reminds me of when I was talking to one of your colleagues and dare I say friends, Karan, about oh, yeah. where the human should touch the loop right like if you have the loop which part should the human be involved in and then which part should the yeah. human not have to be involved in and thinking about that really hard is another great exercise yeah. but right now i want to take you down a little uh journey or story because i imagine this is not unfamiliar for many of the people that are listening when I get tasked with having to go out and create some kind of ML system and I'm going through and of course I start to think about, well, where's my data? What kind of data am I going to need? And maybe I'm at a company that's been around for like 10 years or maybe I'm at a bigger company that's been around for 20 years or whatever. And I start asking people about the data and I start saying, uh, what data do we have? And I get fingers pointing in different directions. Oh, if you need that data, go to this area. And if you need this data, yeah, we've got that for sure. Just check out yeah. this area. And then come to find out two weeks later after all these wild goose chases, like there's been systems that have been broken for years and nobody's yeah. even realized it. The data that we thought we had, we don't. And then 
there's a bunch of this other random data that we don't need or I don't even want to like sift through because we've got 20 years of it. And so the question I have for you is when we are thinking about trying to build something, but we don't necessarily have the most robust data, how can we go about creating something valuable and useful? Yeah. You know, I think that's a great question. And it kind of reminds me of the problem with just like software and code in general. You know, we always know of kind of like legacy software and systems and how much of a pain it is to just be like, what is even going on here? And this like old code that's like written in like COBOL or something like that. And you're like, oh God, <laughs> this is, this is, this is horrible. Um, so it's, it's a painful process. Um, I think that kind of the way that I think about kind of in the same way with like software engineering and dealing with like legacy code and trying to update things, trying to create kind of like a small kind of piece and breaking that off and kind of like demonstrating, start small, you know, start with a simple model with a simple clean data source and start with a kind of as little, um, as little kind of data as you need to be able to accurately predict something and make sure that that's kind of massaged into being high quality and then kind of incrementally add kind of these other sources and thinking about how to deal with those other sources um, such that you can ultimately get kind of like a, a, a you, you probably will not get the entire organization on it, but you can at least like prove the way with this tracer bullet, you know, for kind of a small task. So I think it just kind of comes down to scoping, scoping things out such that you have kind of a clear kind of data sources and, and thinking very hard about that data and the quality of that data in the same way that you do with kind of like software engineering. And you might like kind of piecemeal kind of create some new service or some new kind of like little like repo or something like that with clean code that like you just write an adapter to other things. Um, I think there's like a lot of analogies and a lot of best practices that we can use from software engineering to this kind of new field of data engineering. Um, conceptually. And I think that like uh, kind of increasingly there are more and more tools that will help people kind of go from just like the, the concept of, of, of kind of like these best practices for data engineering into um, actual practice, uh, into practice, which I'm super excited to see. Yeah. And I also think there's something to be said too about not just like hoarding data and not having so much data and collecting everything from an ethics side of things that yeah. we haven't touched on really. And it's like, you don't need to just grab everything because you can and then keep it for as long as you can. What you're, and this whole movement is advocating for is so much more ethical. It's like, get the data that you need, make sure it's high quality and then create high quality stuff with that as opposed yeah. to just tons of data that may or yeah. may not be okay to use and you may or may not actually need it. And so it feels like it is the right way forward. That is such a great uh, point. With that. That is, yeah, I just wanted I, to say that's a great point, you know. Totally. <laughs> yeah, I always that's got, I, <laughs> I've talked about that quite a bit before with other people and how interesting it is when, when the data collection piece comes into play and how like, I think some people have put it much better than I could ever put it, but just talking about how it's like not data collecting, it's data hoarding. And that is not the way, that's not the path you want to be going down, basically. Uh -huh. So I think this is all the time we got, man. This has been so good. I could keep talking to you for another hour. Sadly, I've got to jump to another call, but this has been awesome, Cody. I really appreciate your view. I think that what you're doing is so exciting and it is going to become the next cliche that we hear about. Uh, it's like, keep your data clean or or it's all about the data is, is becoming a meme already. But yeah. I think it's great that it is because what you're doing and, and so many others that you're working with, it's the right way forward. At least it feels like that to me. And I think Vishnu can echo that sentiment. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us, Cody. Uh, I think some of your tips were extremely practical and uh, I'm excited to dive more into the ideas that you've shared with us and looking forward to seeing how you're going to empower practitioners like me to uh, keep uh, data-centric AI at the forefront of what we're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This was super fun to kind of chat about all these different things. And I'm just, I think that we're at like this kind of really cool time in the space of, of ML ops. Of, of just so many tools, so many things that are happening right now to just like 
kind of move the field forward. And I think, as you said, like this is going to become, uh, I'm looking forward to the, to the day that this becomes a cliche and we have this kind of concrete, this is like the data engineering ML ops stack, you know, and that diagram yeah. is kind of as simple as it is for, for spinning up a web application. We have the same things kind of in place for, for, uh, ML applications. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Let's see. And when you, when you do come out with your project, your new project, let us know and we can amplify it on here and let people know and put it in all of our different channels, because I'm sure a lot of people will be interested to hear about that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And also I should, I should say a shout out for like the NeurIPS data centric AI workshop. I think it's probably a little bit more focused on like, uh, academics and stuff like that. But I think that um, the data centric AI movement, we're really trying to create kind of a larger community. And this is like one of those pieces there. So definitely Excellent. watch out for that, for that event. I think there'll be a lot of exciting stuff. Yeah. And we'll throw any link that we can into the description below. So in case you heard anything that you thought was interesting, just feel free to click on it and be magically transported to that part of the internet. That's all we've got today. Great talking to you, Cody. Awesome. Thank you.